When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Unshaken. I'm Jared Halverson. Today I am wearing my Easter egg tie. And that's something that only happens once a year, which lets you know it must be Easter. Sure enough, this is Holy Week. Today, in fact, is Tuesday of Holy Week uh, for me while I'm filming. And I honestly had not planned on, on sharing an Easter lesson for this year. I have been so swamped with a million other things that I'm trying to keep my snorkel tip above water. Uh, and having done two Easter messages from previous years of, of our Unshaken Scripture study, my thought was just go watch one of the old ones. Uh, there, you may still want to. The, the one I did uh, called The Awful Arithmetic of the Atonement is to me still one of the most important lessons I've ever taught. Trying to wrap my head around how the Savior felt about the atonement. And with the help of some art and some music, trying to make sense of what's going on within that within that perfect soul as he tries to metabolize the imperfections of a wicked world. Uh, if you want to spend some time in the emotions of the, of the atonement and its awful arithmetic with its division of soul and multiplication of, of challenges and its addition of, of our sins and sorrows, the subtraction of the Father's Spirit, then that would be a lesson worth reviewing this, this Easter season. And then last year I had taught a lesson about coming boldly to the throne of grace for Easter, since that throne of grace is the mercy seat, and that is the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And so in terms of an Old Testament context for Easter, we are entering God's presence in the tabernacle of Moses, in the temple of Solomon. The veil of the temple is being rent in twain, which is exactly what happened at the close of the crucifixion. So Easter week once again. If you want to look at either of those lessons for this week as you prepare to honor the Savior and worship Him this Easter season, then I'll make sure that I have links at the end of this, uh, of this lesson to go to those two prior ones. But I just felt like I couldn't let Easter come and go First, without wishing you all a happy Easter and expressing to you my love for you, the privilege that I feel it is to be able to spend time with you in the scriptures, and just to rejoice together as fellow saints in the promise of eternal life that the Lord makes to each of us. Easter, we just had general conference two days ago, and there was so much of a focus on Easter and and Palm Sunday that we were celebrating, and the need to elevate our Easter's even above and beyond our celebration of Christmas. Uh, there is, I talked about this in the Awful Arithmetic of the Atonement also, the, the connections between Christmas and Easter, and incarnation and condescension all coming together in hopes of moving us toward atonement and crucifixion and resurrection. The, the parallels between these two times of year and the kinds of things that took place within them are, are profound and moving. Uh, and so in light of just the feelings that I've had, I, I've been torn in the last couple of days of just, oh, wanting to celebrate Easter with all of you, but I just, I don't have time for this and, I, and there's so much going on. And, and yet the Spirit was kind and just said, well, let me teach you a few things. And instead of needing the, the usual hours and hours and hours of preparation to get ready for a Come Follow Me lesson, can I just open your mind and whisper a hint at something that you've never thought about when it comes to Easter? And so if the Lord gave me a gift of understanding in the last two days, the least I can do is to pass that gift on to you. Since I have a feeling it was intended for you and not for me to kink my hose and keep it, <laughs> keep it myself. And here is what blew me away. It has crossed my mind before that sometimes when we take the, partake of the sacrament, 
in the sacrament meeting, we think, ah, that's, that's the most important part of the meeting. And that's where we are, are celebrating ourselves or recommemorating the Last Supper, speaking of Easter week, right? But it struck me that everything Jesus does that night uh, at the Last Supper finds its own parallels in how we participate in a sacrament meeting beyond simply the partaking of the sacrament itself. It's more than that. It's the singing of hymns. They did that. It is the, the introspection of repentance. They did that. There is a cleansing, the washing of feet. We do that in our own way. There is Jesus teaching. And that's why we have sermons and talks that are given during sacrament meeting. Sacrament meeting in, a, in, in its whole, in its entirety, is an echo of the Last Supper of Jesus Christ. But this is what struck me in the last couple days as I've been pondering Easter. In a way, Easter week, Holy Week, the whole week from Palm Sunday until Easter Sunday, in some ways is a microcosm of what we should be doing our entire lives long through the doctrine of Christ. And what struck me Here's how it worked for me. I'll give, I'll give you the, the director's cut. Here's the play-by-play, -play, okay, behind the scenes. It struck me that I was trying to make my way through mentally each day of Holy Week. And remembering that Palm Sunday begins that week with the triumphal entry. And we had such a focus on Palm Sunday at son Sunday session of conference. And the kinds of things that were taking place as people would wave their palm branches and lay their clothing down at the Savior's feet and rejoice in His arrival, knowing him for who he really is. And then the second day, Monday, Jesus cleansed the temple. And what struck me as I was pondering this, I just felt this little whisper, there's the first principles of the gospel. Because seeing Jesus come in and recognize him for who he is and shouting Hosanna in his presence, if that's not a depiction of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know what is. And then the next day, to cleanse the temple. If that's not the embodiment, the ultimate illustration of repentance, then I don't know what that is either. And that's, that was just, those were the first hints that the Spirit gave. Faith on Palm Sunday. Repentance on Holy Monday. Okay, Halverson, take it from there. And that's really what has left me wrestling with the days of Holy Week, the entire Semana Santa, Holy Week, as I learned on my mission. What are we doing each day? And how does it ground us more deeply, more meaningfully in the doctrine of Christ? So here's where I want to go with this, okay? And don't worry, it's not going to be a five-hour lesson. It's probably not even going to be a one-hour lesson, okay? I just want to give you some of the things the Spirit's been giving me as far as what Holy Week can be, day by day by day, throughout the entire week, and grounding it in the doctrine of Christ so that any time we are living the doctrine of Christ, we are celebrating Holy Week. I want every week to be Holy Week, okay? Uh, and so here's how, here's how I've been wrestling with it the last couple of days. For this, we first need to go to the Book of Mormon's explanations, plural, of what the doctrine of Christ really is all about. I mean, this is the glad tidings of great joy that should be to all people. Also known as the good news, also known as the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it's the most important thing that we could possibly come to understand. And we have heard many a lesson this past weekend about the doctrine of Christ. Uh, Elder Ahmad Corbett did an amazing job of letting us know that it's not about activism to try to accomplish some kind of world revolution. It's trusting the simple doctrine of Christ and living into it. And that's what changes people from the inside out. Now, what is the doctrine of Christ? We can summarize it in the fourth article of faith. That's probably our simplest, most condensed version. The we believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel, a.k.a. the doctrine of Christ, is first faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, repentance. Third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. And fourth, the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now to that, because we, we need to add a fifth, which is endure to the end. Because if you're anything like me, I, accomplished, I checked the fourth box when I was eight years old. And that was 40 years ago. So I've been on step five ever since. And it's a tricky part. <laughs> it requires me to keep going back through the previous four. 
That's really what it's all about. Number five, near to the end, is just continually living into steps one, through one, one, two, three, one, two, three, and four. And Nephi makes that clear when he teaches the doctrine of Christ in 2 Nephi 31. Now, we, COVID came after uh, we'd studied 1st and 2nd Nephi in Come Follow Me three years ago. And so I didn't teach 1st and 2nd Nephi on Unshaken. Unshaken didn't exist yet. And so, yes, I'll come back to it next year. Okay, don't worry. But what strikes me about 2 Nephi 31 is that was, for all intents and purposes, that was Nephi's final chapter, at least what he intended to be his final chapter. It ends with the word amen. It's like, drop the mic. I'm done. Okay. It starts with him saying, what I have written sufficeth me. So I'm good. I've given you like 50 chapters worth of 1st and 2nd Nephi, and I've said everything I need to say. But since this is my last, my last lecture, what do I find the most important lesson to give? I'm going to teach you one last time the doctrine of Christ. So 2 Nephi 31 starts with him saying, I'm going to teach you the doctrine of Christ. It ends with him saying, and that was the doctrine of Christ, which suggests that somewhere between those bookends is, you guessed it, the doctrine of Christ. And what is it? It's faith in Christ and repentance thanks to Christ and baptism into full commitment to Christ and then confirmation so that the Holy Ghost can come and confirm that Christ is the true object of our faith and should be. And then endure to the end by feasting upon the words of Christ so that we can maintain our steadfastness in Christ until we come to meet him again. It is such a Christ-centered scripture, 2 Nephi 31. And then, he, and then he's end. he ends it. And 32 and 33 only come in later because we were still confused by step number five and what are we supposed to do? It's like, ah, fine, let me give you two more chapters. But here's the thing I want you to understand. If we find it in the fourth article of faith, we find it again in 2 Nephi 31. We'll find the doctrine of Christ again in 3 Nephi 11 in very condensed form. First thing when Jesus comes among the Nephites, first chapter he's with them, he'll let them know it's about faith and repentance and baptism in the Holy Ghost. And being childlike through the whole process, which is a good explanation of enduring to the end, too. So there's another example of the doctrine of Christ. And then, since the doctrine of Christ was, was Nephi's last lecture, and then Jesus' first lecture, it becomes Jesus' last lecture also. And for that, it's 3 Nephi 27. But this is one of my favorite places to understand the doctrine of Christ, because it's coming from the Savior... And he includes himself in it in ways that we typically forget to do. We can fly through faith, repentance, baptism, and Holy Ghost and never say the name of Jesus or comprehend or appreciate the role of Jesus in all of this. And that's missing the boat. That's focusing on the doctrine, but not the doctrine of Christ. And so listen to how Jesus says it in 3 Nephi 27, which is his, the, the culmination, the crescendo of, of his message among the Nephites. 3 Nephi 27, start in verse 13. And he'll tell you what he's talking about. Behold, I have given unto you my gospel. So that's the good news. That's the doctrine of Christ. And this is the gospel which I have given you. So he's going to explain it to us. Now, he's going to get to faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost in a moment. But notice what he says on the way. This is the gospel which I have given unto you, that I came into the world to do the will of my Father, because my Father sent me. I love that before Jesus explains our part of the doctrine of Christ, our part of the gospel, which is participating in those first principles and ordinances, he gives us his part of the gospel. This is the first place I know where Jesus clearly says, the gospel is what I came to do. The gospel is what the Father sent me to do. It's, it's the ultimate good news because I am that news. I'm God's word made flesh. And what was I made flesh to do? I came into the world, there's Christmas, to do the will of the Father. That's Easter. I came to a... It wasn't just my, my message. 
And it wasn't just my ministry, it was my mission. And my mission was to do the Father's will. And in pre-mortality, what was the Father's will? To send us to an earth so that we could learn. And learn from our mistakes, which would require an atonement. The Father's plan was to have a creation and a fall, which would require an atonement. And so the Father's will was that there would be a lamb without blemish prepared from before the foundation of the world that would come to suffer for our sins and to take on death in order to conquer it and to rise again so, he, he could, so that we could rise alongside him, for him to rise with healing in his wings. Christmas in order for Easter. I came into the world to do the will of my Father. Now he's going to be more specific. And here's where we really see Easter within the doctrine of Christ. 3 Nephi 27 verse 14. And my Father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross. Think about what the Lord is clarifying here. From verse 13, I came into the world to do the will of the Father. Because the Father sent me. And why did he send me? Well, to do his will. What was that will? That I might be lifted up upon the cross. That's incredible. That what the Father had in mind in sending him down to earth was to have him lifted up from the earth upon the cross of Calvary. That even before Christmas, the Father had Easter in mind. That even before creation, God saw Calvary in the distance. He sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross. And here's why, he continues. That I might draw all men unto me. That as I have been lifted up by men, even so should men be lifted up by the Father. To stand before me to be judged of their works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. Literarily, this is beautiful, and it's coming from the Word of God Himself. I was lifted up so that God could lift up everyone else. I was lifted up on the cross to draw all men. Is there something about raising something? Our eyes raised to go see it, to, to lift something, to raise a standard, a flag. All eyes. Well, to raise a cross and all eyes look up to see what's upon it, and our eyes are drawn to that sight, and hopefully our heart is drawn right along with it. I remember reading something about social science where there's something within us, almost instinctually, to turn and look to see suffering take place. It's the rubbernecking on the freeway. It's the seeing the roadkill. It's something I just can't look away. And this social scientist was describing it as almost this morbid fascination, this curiosity that just has to be satisfied. Because it was like, no, don't look, but we just can't help ourselves. And that often is bad. But this social scientist pointed out, it also triggers something good. Because then once we see it, naturally we are drawn to help. The negative side of us is our morbid curiosity. The positive side of us is the compassion that usually comes in its wake, unless we kind of quell that compassion and, and talk ourselves out of it. Well, the morbid curiosity of looking up to someone suffer on a cross hopefully draws our heart to ask the obvious question, what is he doing there? What is he suffering for? Or better said, who is he suffering for? And when he shall see his seed, as Isaiah says, as Abinadi reminds us, he's thinking of us. He's suffering for us. That we might have faith in him. That we might repent of our sins. That we might make covenant commitments to him through baptism and receiving the Holy Ghost. That with his help and grace we might endure to the end. It's his part of the doctrine of Christ that underwrites our part of the doctrine of Christ. And here he foregrounds his part as he's summarizing it in 3 Nephi 27. It's amazing. No wonder he can then say in verse 15 and 16, And for this cause have I been lifted up, 
Therefore, according to the power of the Father, I will draw all men unto me, that they may be judged according to their works. This is a repeat of what he had said in verse 14. But then notice this. And it shall come to pass that whoso repenteth and is baptized in my name shall be filled with what? Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes, repent and baptize in Christ's name shall be filled with the Spirit, of course. And if he endureth to the end, are we seeing all the parts of the fourth article of faith now? Are we seeing the entire doctrine of Christ? We're drawn to him. There's our faith. We repent. We're baptized. We're filled with the Spirit. We then endure to the end. And if we do, behold him, will I hold guiltless before my Father at that day when I shall stand to judge the world. Now he's not done yet. This first round connected his side and our side of the doctrine of Christ. And his side was crucifixion. Our side was faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost, endured to the end. Now let's repeat it again and rewind the clock from Calvary to Gethsemane. Verse 19, no unclean thing can enter into his kingdom. Therefore, nothing entereth into his rest, save it be those who have washed their garments in my blood. Do you see Gethsemane there? Do you see the Savior treading the winepress alone? Do you see his garments being washed in his own blood? Stained because of our sinfulness? Bleeding from every pore. This is a baptism in blood. This is robes of reminding red. And if we are washed in his blood, notice how, what he says next, because of their faith and their repentance of all their sins and their faithfulness unto the end. Now this is the commandment, repent all ye ends of the earth, and come unto me, there's faith, and be baptized in my name that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost. He's spelling it all out, all over again. That ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is my gospel. You see what he did there? Just like Nephi before him. Second Nephi 31, I want to tell you his gospel, his doctrine. End of the chapter, I just told you his doctrine. In between, here's the fourth article of faith in a nutshell. Jesus does the same in Second Nephi, in Third Nephi 27. This is my doctrine. Let me explain it. Or this is my gospel in verse 13. And then how does he end in 21? This is my gospel. And what came between those bookends? His gospel. Which on our side is faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost, endure to the end. But on his part is Easter. It's Holy Week. It's Gethsemane and Golgotha. It's suffering in the garden and dying on the cross. What amazes me about all of this is Joseph Smith got it right in ordering the Articles of Faith the way he did. Our part of the Gospel is the fourth article, but Christ's part in the Gospel is the third article. And, and there's no point in the fourth without what Jesus did in the third. Yes, we believe in faith and repentance and baptism in the Holy Ghost as being essential. But first and foremost, before that, we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved. Through obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, which he'll then tell us in the next, in the next article. But without Gethsemane and without Calvary, there's no point in anything that we do. And so with that in mind, can we walk through Holy Week with an understanding that what we're seeing here in Easter is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Step by step, line upon line, precept upon precept, principle on principle and ordinance upon ordinance, we're watching the third and fourth articles of faith come into form. So, Sunday, Palm Sunday, 
the first day of Holy Week, this is the day of the triumphal entry. And as I hinted at before, thanks to the Spirit's hint to me, there is faith playing out before you. Do we know who Jesus is? Would we call him the son of David, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords coming? Are we preparing for that coming by taking our clothing and laying it at his feet, all of our silks and scarlets and fine twined linen? Are we willing to sacrifice those and have him trample them under his feet? Because we know who he is. When we think of Jesus, do we say, in fact, do we shout, Hosanna? Oh, please, save us. Because we know we need saving, and we know who the Savior is. More than our palm branches, are we raising our palms to sustain him, to call down the blessings of heaven? Do we see in his palms the evidence of his sacrifice? On Palm Sunday, I pray that we will deepen and fully exercise our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing who he is and what he's come to accomplish. If Palm Sunday serves its purpose, then we're ready for Holy Monday and the cleansing of the temple that occurs. We are ready for real repentance. We're ready to look into our temple. I love that Paul calls the body the temple and calls the body of Christ, in other words, the members of the church, a temple as well. And that Jesus comes to cleanse it as part of the beginning of this holy week. He had done that at the beginning of his ministry. He's here to do it again at the end. It's his father's house at the beginning. It's his house now, taking greater and greater ownership of it all. Are we letting him do that for us? Can, is, it just, is it our body and we can do what we want with it? Or are we honoring him and allowing him to claim it as his own? What would you want my body to do and not do? What would you want me to take in and leave out? How would you want me to use my hands as your own to serve those around me? Sins of commission to repent of, sins of omission to overcome. Have we brought things in to the outer courts of our temple that seem to be getting in the way of what the temple is designed to do? Do those money changers need to be driven out? Do those tables need to be overturned? Is there cleansing? Are we even, if we have enough faith knowing that the triumphal entry from yesterday, that Christ is coming in, but now he's coming in deeper. He's not just riding into Jerusalem. He's coming into a temple that I consider my own. Are we willing, if we know who he is, to let him shine the light into whatever deep, dark recesses of our temple we'd rather keep in the dark? Or are we willing to repent of everything? What stands in the way of real worship? What's, what has got to go? Every Monday and every day between Mondays would be a day worth cleansing our temple so that we can fully repent. What comes next is Tuesday. And this is an interesting one because Tuesday is a day of teaching. And I was trying to, well, faith and repentance, and then we got to do baptism in the Holy Ghost. So where do, where do we see baptism on Tuesday? And I realized as I was wrestling with this and pondering the days of Holy Week, we're not there yet. Because the real, what I would consider baptism and Holy Ghost, we have to wait till Thursday. And I'll tell you why when we get there. There is specific talk of baptism and Holy Ghost on that Thursday. So let's hold off for that. But then where do we, what do we do on Tuesday and Wednesday? Uh, Wednesday is especially hard because we don't even know what Jesus did on Wednesday. We do know what he did on Tuesday, though. And Tuesday was a day of teaching. Tuesday was a day of, of preaching parables about two sons, one that obeyed and one that didn't. 
a parable about wicked husbandmen. Do they recognize Jesus, the, the son of the Lord of the vineyard when he comes or not? Parable of the marriage of the king's son. Are we ready to, to come in from the highways and byways? Will we respond to the Lord's invitation and come to the wedding feast? Or are we just prepared to miss it and don't really care much about it to begin with? It's on Tuesday that Jesus will teach about oh, the, the, the signs of the times and the second coming of Christ. The great Olivet Discourse takes place on, on Tuesday. And more parables like the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents. He's teaching all kinds of things. He's also calling out the wickedness of the scribes and Pharisees. I mean, Monday was the cleansing of the temple physically. Tuesday was the cleansing of the temple rhetorically. And he was leaning into the scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites for all the things that they were doing wrong. I mean, there's, he's, not holding any, he's not pulling any punches on that Tuesday of Holy Week. So whether it's teaching the faithful how to be more faithful or teaching the wicked just how wicked they've been, oh, there's a lot to learn on Tuesday. And that's important because without those lessons, you're not ready for Thursday's baptism or confirmation. You're not ready to at least, you're, at least you're not ready to take it seriously, as seriously as we should. So how do I make Tuesday Holy Tuesday? Well, to borrow a phrase from section 19 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which is drenched in atonement, suffering, symbolism, he says, learn of me and listen to my words. Walk in the meekness of my spirit and you shall have peace in me. If we're to learn of the Lord, if we're really to listen to his words, before we're ready to commit to fully walk with him in the meekness of his spirit, we're going to need today for that. In fact, we're probably going to need two <laughs> or many more. And so in my holy week, as I'm trying to internalize the gospel, the doctrine of Christ, yes, I know him enough on, Monday, on Sunday to wave my palms and remove my worldly clothing enough to proclaim my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I know him well enough to know that I, have, I, that I can repent of my sins, that I can have faith unto repentance, and I will let him come and cleanse my temple. In fact, I'll help him do it. I'll cast out money changers myself. But baptism and the commitment that entails, am I ready for that? Do I have sufficient faith? Have I sufficiently repented? Hmm. Let me hold off just a moment and spend a Tuesday learning from the Lord. That will deepen my faith. It will put in proper perspective the timing of all of this, that Christ will come again. There's, am I a wise virgin or a foolish one? Will I be a son who obeys or a son that doesn't? Will I come to the wedding feast as invited? Is there more repentance I need to engage in? Am I still a scribe and a Pharisee and a hypocrite? in certain places that I didn't let him cleanse the temple completely. There's so much for us to do on Holy Tuesday. And even on Holy Wednesday, before we're ready for the baptism of, of Maundy Thursday, as it's often called. Now, Wednesday is tricky because we really don't have much on record of what Jesus did at all. Ah, uh, it's, it's hard to date the, the, the days of Holy Week anyway. And there's some disagreement between the Synoptic Gospels and John. We don't need to worry about all of that right now. That as we go through Come Follow Me in later weeks, we will go through day by day everything that we have. Okay, well, that, that'll be a long lesson. Don't worry. But for this overview of Holy Week, Wednesday, in some, day, in some ways knowing what Thursday would entail, maybe it's a good thing that Jesus doesn't seem to be quite so busy on Wednesday. Maybe he, he needed a midweek day of rest, a Sabbath between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, for him to prepare for his baptism in blood that would take place the next day. Maybe we need to take time to be holy instead of frantically running around looking for things to do as part of our discipleship. 
Maybe we need to take days of real rest and prepare ourselves for the Passover, which is likely what Jesus and his apostles were doing that day. I think there was a lot more going on on Wednesday than meets the eye. But our eyes aren't given the chance to meet it. And so we just ponder and think, how would Jesus have prepared? If he spent a night in prayer to his Father before he called his apostles? If he spent a night in prayer to his Father before he walked upon the water? So often what Jesus did to recharge was to commune with his Father in heaven. I imagine a lot of that took place on Wednesday also. And that can be part of our Holy Week as well. One thing we also know that most likely took place on Wednesday was Judas went and met with the leaders and received his 30 pieces of silver and plotted his betrayal of Christ. Maybe that's something we should be pondering on our Wednesdays of Holy Week also. The opposition that we will undoubtedly face if we fully commit to Christ tomorrow in our day of baptism and confirmation. Oh, blessed are those who suffer persecution in my name. Jesus himself would suffer it at the hands of one of his own apostles. And if we can prepare ourselves for whatever we might face, betrayals and denials, even from people who, who we trusted, will our, do we have sufficient faith to be able to endure whatever comes our way. Because if I'm going to put my hand to that plow, I cannot look back. Okay? So as we ponder Wednesday, don't skip straight from Sunday's faith and Monday's repentance to Thursday's baptism and Holy Ghost. Spend a day like Tuesday learning from the Lord. And then spend a day like Wednesday preparing to make that covenant. Pondering persecution, preparing ourselves through real, deep worship connection with our Father in heaven. Because when Thursday dawns, we'll be, will we be ready for the next ordinances of the gospel, having fully prepared through the first principles of the gospel? Now, Thursday is often called Maundy Thursday because Maundy comes from a Latin word. If you speak Spanish, mandatos is commandments. And so uh, Thursday was a day of commandments. Chief among them, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I love you. Part of my commitment to Christ, living the first great commandment, is a commitment to the second great commandment, loving my neighbor. Am I ready for that? Now, at the Last Supper, and Thursday is where we get the Last Supper, and where we get Gethsemane in those nighttime hours. And to understand this as a baptism and confirmation of all Jesus promised he would do. A baptism in blood is, what I, is how I keep referring to it. And I didn't make up that language. It, I don't think it's overly dramatic because Jesus is the one who said it. Even before Gethsemane, as he looked to it in the distant future, well, the not too distant future, he said at one point, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And oh, how I am straightened till it be accomplished. That was his immersion in agony. That was his baptism in blood. That's Gethsemane. It's an olive press, yes, but it's a baptismal font as well. And Jesus immersed himself in our fallen humanity. He submerged himself in our sin. He descended below all things so he could lift us up together with him when on the next day he would be lifted up upon the cross. To understand that baptism and all that he did at the Last Supper to prepare himself for it, this is a day where we ought to be preparing for our baptism and our renewal of baptismal covenants each week in the sacrament. Are we willing to look inward, to explore even deeper recesses of a temple that still is in need of cleansing? As we ask him, Lord, is it I? And yes, it is. It's then on that Thursday that Jesus can wash our feet and through our feet wash away all the dirt we've picked up through our worldly wanderings. It's at the garden 
that Jesus will tra tra tread the winepress alone and give us that blood with which we can wash our garments. It's also at the Last Supper that he offers us bread and wine in token of his body and blood. This is a sacramental moment. And what are we participating in, in the sacrament? What are we renewing and recovenanting to do? To follow him in faith through every triumphal entry. To repent of our sins so that our temples can be cleansed. To continue to learn of him and wait for him to take his name upon us, to always remember him, to keep his commandments. Why? So that we may always have his spirit to be with us. That's the Holy Ghost. And what did Jesus teach at the Last Supper and in what I call his sermon after supper as he's walking toward the Garden of Gethsemane? Among other things, he taught the apostles about the Comforter that he would send. That I have to leave so that the Comforter may come. He was making way for the Holy Ghost which is again why I make Thursday of Holy Week my reminder of baptism and confirmation. If nothing else does, the Atonement of Christ ought to confirm to us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Confirm to us that Christ so loved us that he would suffer for our sins. Confirm to us the reality of who he is so that we don't betray him with a kiss, but instead fully come unto him. Now, if Thursday is behind us, what's left? We have a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but in the doctrine of Christ, we've already spoken of faith and repentance and baptism in the Holy Ghost. What's left? Well, thank you, Nephi, for reminding us. It's endure to the end. And if there were ever a day when one's endurance was tested, it was Good Friday, which, yes, is good in its effects as far as we're concerned, but not good in its experience as far as Jesus. It was that Friday he suffered mock trial after mock trial, but endured them all gracefully and graciously. It was on that Good Friday that he endured the denial of one of his closest friends. It was on that Good Friday that he endured mockery and persecution. It was on that day that he endured the cries of the crowds shouting, Crucify him. And it was on that Good Friday that he endured the cross itself. Lifted up to lift all of us up with him. Drawn to him as he draws us to the Father. It was that endurance of agony that culminated in that final statement, it is finished. I've accomplished the Father's will. And if there were anything, if there were any phrase that perfectly captures endurance to the end, it's Christ's statement that the end had finally come. It was finished for him at least as far as mortality is concerned. Elder Ballard has said we need to keep the, the, the commandments and, and keep our faith in Christ until we are safely dead. Fascinating word. Well, Jesus was safely dead. But even with that, Holy Week is not yet over. And neither is our living of the, of the gospel and doctrine of Christ. Thanks to our understanding, through revelation to a modern prophet, Joseph F. Smith, we understand, what, we understand what Jesus did on Holy Saturday, which the rest of the Christian world simply sees as Christ's body lying lifeless in the tomb. Well, Peter hinted at this. So the rest of the Christian world should know a little bit more than they often pretend to. But thanks to our understanding of Doctrine and Covenant section 138, Saturday was a busy day for Jesus. The final Jewish Sabbath before the Lord's Day emerged on Easter Sunday with the, the, the first new beginning. Jesus was not resting on that day of rest. That Saturday, Sabado de Gloria, they say in Spanish, Saturday of Glory, 
Jesus was extending that glory to the spirits in prison. He was organizing the righteous in the spirit world, ready to send them forth to proclaim liberty to the captives, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. What Jesus had done the day before, how reassuring people that were suffering, how forgiving the soldiers that were crucifying him, making sure that his mother Mary was taken care of by the disciple of John, reassuring a thief beside him that he would yet see paradise. Well, that was yesterday. Today, we're in paradise. At least the combination of paradise and prison. And you in prison are invited to paradise the moment you know the truth so that the truth can make you free. Now, do we get a chance to do that ourselves? As part of our endurance to the end that we learned on Good Friday, what can I be doing on my Saturdays of Holy Week? What can I be doing to extend the glory of Saturday of glory? I can do what Jesus did. I can preach liberty to the captives. I can let people know the truth so that the truth can make them free. In fact, I can gather Israel on both sides of the veil. Since what Jesus did on Holy Saturday is what allows us to do what we do every day in the temple. Makes me wonder, next time I go to the temple, do I just want to consider it Holy Saturday? Maybe I'll go on Saturday and, and participate in what the Lord did on His Saturday of Holy Week. And anything I do to gather Israel on this side of the veil through missionary work or perfecting the saints and the other side of the veil through temple work and family history work, that is making, that is extending the blessings of Holy Week to all of God's children. It's a powerful, powerful time. Not resting, but making sure God's work is fully accomplished. With Saturday behind me then, there in the early dawn hours, as disciples, sister saints primarily, come running to a tomb they did not yet know was empty. Happy Easter. Easter Sunday. It's been a full week since the triumphal entry. And now there's been an entry that makes, so triumphal, it makes the, that makes the previous weeks oh, look pretty weak in comparison. Christ has re-entered the land of the living. Christ has conquered death. And there is no greater triumph in all of history than what Jesus did to conquer sin and death. The grave and hell, the two monsters that Jacob warns us about. To think of Easter Sunday and the light that dawned that day to cast darkness out of every life, to say to all who suffer, Sunday will come to eliminate darkness with the presence of His glorious light. That is Easter Sunday, and it is a new beginning, a new week, a new start. This is the eighth day of Holy Week, if we're being technical. And on this eighth day of new beginnings, a new week is beginning, a new day has dawned. And to think about rising with healing in His wings, rising in newness of life to give new life to us all. Isn't that what the doctrine of Christ is supposed to do? We finally made it. We have arrived at a moment of absolute conquest and consecration. Jesus has given, has given everything he is. And he's asking us to do likewise. So as I endure to the end, Good Friday, as I engage in God's continual saving work, Saturday, am I consecrating my all so that on my Easter Sunday it is new life? I have been transformed in Christ, transfigured with Him, raised to newness. That's what Easter Sunday is supposed to do. And if I do it the way He showed me, then every week is Holy Week. 
because every week allows me to deepen my discipleship within the doctrine of Christ. My prayer for all of us, my friends, is, is that we can celebrate Easter not only more deeply, but more frequently. <laughs> that we can see... I don't mean it has to be on the specific days. Uh, we, we can repent on more days than just Monday. We, the, the temple gets dirty more, more quickly than just that. Our temple, anyway. Uh, it, it, our baptism, our renewal of covenants, our engagement in God's saving work can happen any day of the week, but to, to map it across Holy Week, Holy week has been eye-opening and soul-expanding for me these last couple of days. It does make me want to live the doctrine of Christ more constantly so that Easter is every Sunday and every day in between. Can I close with one last reminder from Scripture of the doctrine of Christ? And since we started with Jesus's in 3 Nephi 27, can we now rewind and go back to Nephi's in 2 Nephi 31? If we see how he finishes that chapter, which, like I said, was his intent at finishing his message, he sums it all back up again. Our part of the doctrine of Christ and Christ's part of the doctrine of Christ are Holy Week, all rolled into one. Second Nephi 31, turn with me to verse 17. Having already explained faith and repentance and baptism in the Holy Ghost, he next says, Wherefore, do the things which I have told you I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. For for this cause have they been shown unto me, that ye might know the gate by which ye should enter. For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism by water, and then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. So there's our part all over again, those four steps in the fourth article of faith. But to have seen what your Lord and your Redeemer should do, there's the third article of faith. There's Holy Week. There is Easter introducing us to the will of the Father as made manifest in the life of the Son. Nephi then says in verse 18, And then are ye in this straight and narrow path, which leads to eternal life. You're in the middle of Holy Week yourself, the middle of a holy life. But what do I do from here? He says, Yea, ye have entered in by the gate. That was triumphal entry. That was cleansing the temple. That was learning from the Lord and preparing yourselves. But are you fully committed are you ready for Passover Thursday? Are you ready to endure through Good Friday? Nephi says, Ye have done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son. That's what got you to this point. Ye have received the Holy Ghost, which witnesses of the Father and the Son, unto the fulfilling of the promise which He hath made, that if ye entered in by the way, ye should receive. But those are His promises. What about your promises are you fully committed? Are you ready for your baptism in blood? Your covenant consecration? Because verse 19, Now, my beloved brethren, after ye have gotten into this straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done. And then he answers his own question. Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for ye have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him. Can you sense why I love that phrase so much? That's, that's enduring to the end. That's the covenant we made. That's fully seeing Christ in Gethsemane and on Calvary. Personifying what unshakenness means. With that unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Mighty enough to endure the agony of the garden and the cross. Then verse 20, wherefore, because I've seen all of that, because I followed Christ all the way through Holy Week, what am I now willing to do, able to do? Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ and endure to the end, Behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Oh, it is finished. 
not just the Savior's suffering, but the Savior's work, the Father's will, we will have eternal life. And then Nephi ends with verse 21, Now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way. And there is none other way nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ. And the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. Oh, amen and amen, Nephi. Amen, Jesus, from 3 Nephi 27. Amen to our experience through Holy Week. Because we have come to know the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost as we've watched Jesus progress from triumphal entry through a garden of suffering, a cross of agony, and a tomb that is permanently empty. I testify of Jesus Christ. I express my love for him and to him this Holy Week. I pray that he knows of my faith in him and my desire to repent of sins I am sorry for committing. I want to learn of him and hear his words and walk in the meekness of his spirit. I want to climb the Mount of Olives and understand how short the time is until his glorious return. I want to take time to be holy and just prepare myself to more fully and faithfully renew my covenants of baptism and Holy Ghost, not at a last supper, but a supper I can repeat Sunday after Sunday as I partake of the sacrament. I want to immerse myself in a life of discipleship. And I want to be more fully worthy of the Holy Ghost's constant companionship. Here I am four decades into my endurance to the end. And I, I feel that I am still far from finished. I pray that I can endure it well and follow the example of Christ through it all. May I engage in his work of gathering and look forward to a glorious resurrection when I will once again see the gardener and hear him call me by name until I fully recognize who he is. My dear brothers and sisters, Happy Easter. Every day. Happy Holy Week. Every week. This week as we speak of Christ and teach of Christ and write of Christ, may we more fully rejoice in Christ, knowing he is the source of every good thing. I bear my witness of him and wish you, my beloved brothers and sisters, a happy Easter. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.